So, very welcome today to a webinar, which is going to be led by two students, uh, Oras Mirado and Megan O'Connor. And we, what they are going to talk about today is celebrating the European Year of Youth through Academic Integrity, how students help in establishing institutional integrity and values. So, without further ado, actually, I am going to, to leave the floor to the two of you. Would you like to introduce yourself first and then perhaps share screen, give us a productive discussion. I'm really looking forward to listening to what you have to say because students are such an important part of academic integrity. Yeah, anyways, um, the slide doesn't contain any of the information I'm going to talk about. It's just for the background. So. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a bachelor student and I'm working on uh, integrity issues, both within ESO and have been involved some, in some integrity issue um, work um, before at my home university in, uh, in Belarus. Um, yeah, and I also wanted from the beginning to mention that um, we would appreciate if you would um, write your questions in the um, in the Q and A, um, as uh, Sonia mentioned, so we can um, yeah recap and also answer to them in the end of um, on of our little presentation. We will try to um, not to bore you. Um, it's going to be really interesting. Um, bear with us and um, yeah enjoy the presentation. I would give the uh, word to Megan to um, present her and then um, we can proceed with a presentation of the uh, organizations we are working for. Thank you so much, Aras. So my name is Megan O'Connor. A lot of you before, um, I am the former Vice President for Academic Affairs with Union Students in Ireland and a former education in a local institution. So I'm now currently working as a full-time nurse, but I'm still a huge fan of all that's being done in the academic integrity space around the world. So I'm just very happy to, to come along and lend my support or as in the work that she's doing with her. Um, can you press the next slide? Yeah, yeah so today's topic is um, how students um, help to establish um, institutional integrity and um, what, are, what is the role of other stakeholders in that. Um, and uh, we'll start with the introduction to ESU and what this organization is doing. Um, ESO is the European Students' Union um, is, and it's an umbrella organization of 45 national unions of students from different European countries and it works on um, European lobby for students' interests in higher education policy um, and it was founded in uh, 1982 so it's a very old organization um, and ESO is one, uh, is one of the key stakeholders of Bologna process I'm not sure if you're aware of the, what is that, but it's basically about um, European common higher education policy area, um, which is beyond um, EU and includes many other countries. Um, yeah, could you? Um, ESSA's work on academic integrity. Um, it's since the academic integrity itself is um, quite a new area, I would say, for uh, collaboration between NGOs. Um, on the European level and students involved, and since ESO thinks that students involve, involvement in this um, area is very important, um, ESO engages with um, international organizations um, working on integrity uh, and ethics issues, such as ENAI, which is European Network for Academic Integrity, ETINET, um, Platform of Council of Europe, and um, we represent their students' perspective on academic integrity issues. Um, we also participate in drafting documents on academic integrity um, and also researching the matter together with different um, organizations. For example, we had a project called FRAUDS um, and we um, basically made a questionnaire um, of around 3,000 students on different topics um, of academic integrity. And then to provide a background in the Irish context, which I've been a part of for the last few years, the National Academic Integrity Network was set up in 2018, um, and it was focused on actually institutions to 
uh, to be engaged with the challenges that are being presented by academic misconduct or embed a culture of academic integrity among providers and develop the national resources and tools to address those challenges and issues. And um, so collectively, um, they have done in the last three years, it's just coming up to their third birthday. Um, and last year they launched uh, a um, on academic integrity guidelines um, following extensive consultation process education institutions, uh, students, staff, and a broad range of external stakeholders, along with all of the international data that's been made available by our colleagues around the world. Um, there was also um, completed which informed that, and all of these are hyperlinked in this slide if you want to. Um, so um, basically what they're doing is they're offering advice on not just how to uphold academic integrity and also how it, how to deal with those academic um when they arise so i think everyone here is very familiar with what our understanding is but i always kind of come back to it because unless everyone's on the same page that's used um across institutions and at a national level especially um i think that it's all truly really be able to um adjust it I saw a fantastic presentation by Sarah Eaton where how um, you're not dealing with a case of academic integrity, you're dealing with a case of academic misconduct itself is academic integrity. And I think that that language that we use um, is, is really, really important moving forward. And it begs the question, why do students engage in academic misconduct? Sometimes they don't realise what um, and what is that down to? Is it down to the students not being educated sufficiently in the area? Um, and different programs and policies in place. Sometimes students are completely overwhelmed with their workload. Keeping the academic knowledge to recognize when they're plagiarizing or engaging in other forms of misconduct. They um, are unable to manage their time and it's something that they haven't practiced previous to their education. Of course, everyone's human. They might have personal issues such as illness or bereavement. Fear of failure um, are also, we've seen a huge increase in targeted advertising at students. If you see the, the insane work that's really um, happened with online file sharing, work that Check has done and stuff, um, it's really targeting students when they're at their most vulnerable. We see a lot of like that. So you can understand how easy it is for a student to fall victim to this. Um, and to promote academic integrity, I think we all hold a level of responsibility hold our quality assurance processes and unless there is a multi-state um, I don't believe that we can overcome the issues that we're faced with across the sector at the moment. Um, so students, teaching and administration staff, management and of course as well the community education systems um, around the world. Yeah and uh... Talking about academic integrity, um, at this point, we cannot ignore the fact that uh, many of our lives and dimensions of both higher education and academic integrity um, itself was impacted by COVID. Um, and it's important to um, underline that COVID um, accelerated change in higher education, which was actually long awaited because um, finally, uh, all those digitalization policies started suddenly working and many, many universities and countries um, uh, in a very short uh, terms um, implemented many changes um, into the classrooms and teaching and learning and both assessment um, was also uh, one of the mostly influenced areas by COVID and digitalization. Um, so when the switch to the digitalization happened, um, many decisions made uh, were in, in kind of a um, hurry because there was no um, no uh, actually common instruments, interoperable instruments to use for the universities um, in place. Um, this caused, um, not caused, this was um, actually, uh, this created a new market of online assessment tools um, and um, there was a co huge competition between them and uh, this was a big factor of commodification which uh, we don't like um, 
because it's bad. Um, and uh, it also impacted mental and physical health of uh, everyone who's involved in this uh, drastical change of um, academic lifestyle. Um, and this includes also students, teachers, uh, administrative staff who had to work distantly. Um, yeah, and uh, as I already mentioned, new learning and teaching environments where um, many skills which were um, before useful for the classroom teaching and learning was no longer um, uh, usable for the um, online environment. And this posed a lot of uh, questions to uh, many actors in higher education. Um, can you list? Yeah. Um, and one of these questions uh, is proctoring and uh, control. Um, yeah, um, proctoring tools um, were in place um, before the COVID actually came. They were always there. But um, when COVID imposed the question of what to do with the assessment and how to ensure that students are being assessed fairly and they actually get the marks they deserve. Um, it was quite a um, quite an easy solution for uh, many questions. Um, although there were many uh, questions about the um, effectiveness of the of this method of assessment at the online exams, um, this was uh, being used until a certain point in many countries. In some countries, it is still being used. Um, and it also depends from university to university. Um, and um, what does this mean? Um, this means that uh, in, 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 uh, in search for fair assessment for the um, online um, teaching and learning environment, uh, we started using um, before unseen instruments. And this posed many questions. Uh, for, for example, accessibility, um, accessibility for the uh, neurodivergent students um, at the exams who experience um, anxiety, uh, even, even without this kind of stress, and it's um, already too much for them. Or uh, that when artificial intelligence was being used um, during the proctoring uh, of the exams, um, this posed also additional stress um, for the people because there's, uh, their eyes were uh, moving on the screen and fastly. This um, might potentially cause um, some problems for the students because this, this could be considered as attempt to, um, to cheat or the signs of the cheating. So in that setting, um, yeah, what, like uh, we should also understand that um, um, what if the way students learn um, was higher order about which we're gonna talk a bit later uh, and exams conducted were in the nearest to the reality setting where there are always open sources one can consult and the exams are the actual tasks um, one will be doing at the future work be that at the um, offices and factories or scientific work, and is the encyclopedic and uh, factual knowledge um, still of high relevance for humans to memorize when these yeah. all basically can be delegated to IT systems and artificial intelligence. And in that case, should surveillance and control prevail over specially designed teaching and learning and evaluation of actual work skills where cheating is almost impossible. Um, is digitalization challenge um, necessarily implies stricter control such as e-proctoring, um, especially with involvement of artificial intelligence? Is the usage of artificial intelligence by external actors to observe the personal room of a student who is to be treated with trust and respect um, according to the fundamental values of integrity, um, justifiable the higher risk of 
cheating um, at the online exams. Um, will students treat their teachers um, with due trust and respect after that? Can they approach their teachers in case of unintended misconduct with openness? Are they still in one community? Is this method of control inclusive, as I already mentioned, towards neurodivergent students or students with just higher level of um, anxiety due to series of exams happening at the same time? Um, and can this actually influence the final results students can get? Because if you are nervous, you tend to forget things um, you learned, which can in the end um, yeah, bring, bring to the unfair assessment. Yeah, I think we can go to the next. Um, mental health and um, misconduct behavior, actually there, there is a term uh, called misconduct behavior. And um, I was actually, uh, like I first heard that at the best practice conference of the Council of Europe uh, Ethernet platform. And uh, the researcher from the Netherlands was um, actually researching the, um, um, yeah, the misconduct behavior and the uh, like higher level of stress um, for the scientists writing um, some project on um, academic research. And, um, but still after that, I searched for mental health and misconduct behavior researches for actually students. And I realized that there is a um, big gap um, between students and researchers in that case. Um, and I think it's nice um, to, uh, talk about that and to um, empower those researchers who actually want to, um, yeah, to, to uh, get more knowledge on that because I think um, it would be ignorant to say that mental health is not influencing uh, misconduct behavior at all. Um, and talking about mental health, uh, we should also understand the student's life situation in general. Um, in general is important um, and it can influence um, their behavior in academia, not only misconduct behavior, but any other behavior where pe um, students' motivation is lower because they have um, students' poverty going on where they, they have to work additionally and they cannot earn enough money to cover their basic needs. Meaning um, the current situation students are facing in many countries um, or, uh, performance enhancing drugs or substances. Um, and this area is actually uh, not really discovered and uh, researched, especially in Europe. Um, and um, we should all understand and come to the common um, understanding. What is that um, is actually about? Is it a cheating um, to use them and how to help uh, to um, yeah, get rid of the stigma on the people who can, who might get addicted to those substances. Um, and all in all, lack of mental health culture where people don't use um, mental health issues as explanation for some complex situations where they cannot actually solve it without solving the mental health um, issues. Um, where do we put the, um, yeah, and, and, and this um, necessarily implies that um, in, in, in different um, societies, we of course have different understanding of what, what is the academic achievement and uh, the societal pressure, which, um, which is caused by the societal beliefs or even values that the students need to get all the best marks um, and parents telling that this is very important. And um, in some cases, you are either getting the best mark or you are not, you are not getting the mark at all. And why, why is everything linked to the marks and not the actual um, knowledge one should get during the um, studying um, periods? Um, this all, um, yeah, forces the question, where do we put our values as society and how is the societal pressure influences students' understanding of academic achievements? And 
what happens when institutions are also led by those values and the policies written are actually um, all about um, assessments with links to the grades and can students really lead their parents and this is also a very important question because the parents even there if they, they are really far away how they um, taught us to understand um, the achievements during the schools and the school system from the kindergarten I think is the uh, very important question to understand how we grew up um, and the parents are playing a big role in it. Um, yeah. Sorry, you think I'd remember to unmute myself online presentations. But um, the next we're going to go on to the student partnership and teaching and learning. And again, I think the conversation surrounding partnership in this area is a really, really important one. Um, again, in taking inspiration from another webinar I attended on a similar topic, um, the question, you know, how do we change the conversation from how do we stop students cheating to how do we ensure students? Um, and I think it was it was a really, really good question because ultimately we need students to end and be able to implement their learning and practice and not just to reiterate what's been said in the last paper. Um, and breaches of academic integrity are a moral issue. They're a policy, of course, a teaching and learning issue. Um, so how do we achieve a higher order? Um, communication and partnership between staff and students is a vital part of ensuring that we make and assessment practices. Um, and as part of those quality assurance, should usually find staff and students who are more engaged in the um, offering students um, opportunities to practice their skills through formative assessment, consideration of students from different backgrounds, as Oris has um, alluded to earlier, um, and also the feedback loop. Um, so if a lecturer is offering feedback on an assessment, be able to engage in that feedback in future and be able to really learn from it and practice the skills and the song, um, and understanding that, you know, the purpose of each of their assessments and understanding different types of assessments um, and then of course trust and open dialogue um, a model of quality assurance structures um, I, I think that again the conversation that we're having um, is about those quality assurance per processes within institutions um, taken as a priority for senior management because I think this is something that at this point should be on the risk right institution and pretty high up at that so um We'll see how it goes. With deterring academic misconduct, um, again, we're talking about the culture of honesty and conversations, um, which have been really fantastically spearheaded by um, our colleagues in the university. Um, policies supported by procedures um, and ensuring things are fit for practice and mitigating against contract cheating. The students that engage in academic misconduct, they're not, they're not always. They are usually aware of the risks and um, those risks include getting caught feedback on work that you yourself haven't completed and missing out on that learning opportunity but for many it's considered a better option than the risk of not doing well Do you know whereas um has already talked about the impact um, of perhaps not doing well in education being under pressure from different external sources and also the barriers to education um serve as a huge part of that in terms of the cost of living and things like that so I think that a long time, the discussion surrounding academic integrity at an institutional level, institutions detect misconduct, how do we catch the students? Um, but we know from the research that's been done, especially since we came into this kind of new digital era, that institutions are a percentage of the misconduct that actually occurs. Um, and we need to ensure that that um, culture forward and improved and that the policies really support the procedures and allow the implementation of the policies themselves. Uh, when we're talking about detection and sanctioning of academic misconduct, we should absolutely ensure that all of the policies are accessible, that they're applicable, that they're in consultation with the students um, on the ground. And we need to ensure that educators individually are taking steps to mitigate against the risks of to the likes of contract cheating 
um, and looking at how this can be put within the institution, preventative measures can be put in place. So with responding to a hugely important aspect of all of this is how we respond to when these issues occur. There's a variety of levels of seriousness, um, but we are all human and sometimes we can make um, and students deserve the opportunity to reflect and learn from theirs, no matter what the consequences. Uh, a student might learn their lesson when they're disciplined, um, when they're caught. But are we ensuring that we that they know better and that they're better equipped to deal with the situation that they found themselves in to take the risk of participating in academic dishonesty? Um, we should really try and learn the students' point of views and consider their motivations, coming back to the point on mitigating the risks. Were the students completely overwhelmed by a seemingly impossible workload? Can we look at assessment, working together in collaboration between departments? Um, and did the student really see the of what they were doing? Did they feel like they had no other choice? Um, and, you know, where are you there if the student can or can't reach out? Um, I think all of these questions really deserve to be answered will be supported by institutions over time, um, but we need to ensure that we maintain and improve the in this area. So the students role moving forward, I think the students in the creation of those policies is vital. I mean, I think I've said it two or three times now. Um, experience in the current higher education landscape is drastically different to that of students four or five six years ago um i think that if we don't conversations in those consultations and be prepared to both update our policies and implement um we really need to ensure that that is a, a first priority um with new sophisticated ways of contract cheating online file sharing and so much more um and for sure, we're, we are finally at a point where we're seeing students are able to recognise when this is happening. The campaigns that have been run by the network um, and particularly the students' unions who have been um, really, really strong um, points of contact for students for running campaigns and things like that. Um, and while to students, it poses a really serious threat to the quality assurance in higher education globally. Any questions? So, if anyone has any questions, please just uh, raise your hand, write in the chat. I hope it works now, or send it in the QA. I can also unmute you if you would like to uh, just let me know in one way or another. And, and thank you, uh, Megan and Oris, for this amazing presentation. You really touched upon so many important things uh, regarding uh, student participation. Uh, and I think it's, uh, I, I agree with you uh, definitely, this is extremely important to, to uh, include students in the work because otherwise, and, and you, you always have such good ideas. <laughs> uh, I really think that the, the uh, the one question I, I, I think is very important that Oraz touched upon is, is the mental health issues and the connection to, to academic integrity, because I know that many students can be really triggered also by uh, having to go to the disciplinary board, uh, not least. So, so we need to, to be very careful how we handle that type of questions and uh, in order to make not to make things even worse for them. So yes. Uh, do you have any ideas how how to to have you got any input from students regarding those issues? Yeah. Um, there is, as I as I already mentioned, there is lack of research, mm -hmm. and there is certain link between uh, PhD students. Um, I don't remember um, this researcher's name, but um, he's from the Netherlands and I think he's from the um, Erasmus University. And he mentioned that the research showed that there is a link between misconduct behavior and the uh, higher stress um, PhD students are uh, having while writing their um, final work. Um, and I think this 
has also also some um, yeah um, some links with also students um, and how they are like uh, approaching their studies and also assessment and also higher societal expectations from students and um, yeah not not all parents are actually having healthy mental health culture where they can understand that um, not always uh, one has to get the best marks, not always one has to get the uh, best achievements. And um, yeah, the question is also how we understand the achievements. Um, and also I think mental health doesn't always mean, um, doesn't always mean reacting to the mental health issues, but it's also about the certain way of um, seeing the world through mental health prisma. When you can uh, say that if the person, um, when you can see that if the person cannot participate at some exams and uh, at the moment, it's not anyhow linked to uh, any certificate, for example, from a doctor saying that this person cannot go, it can be just that the person is really weak and cannot just go today to this exam, even if he or she or they like were well prepared for that. And it should be clear that um, it should not be that complex to deregister. Um, I know from my own case uh, at my university in Germany, um, it's certain uh, the registration and the registration for the exams has their deadlines and one cannot just deregister after the deadline. Um, this is one issue. And also in order to prove that um, your reason not coming to the exam was eligible, you need to bring some papers saying that you were actually uh, having health issues, which is not always the case. You don't have to have um, the paper proof if you're just feeling bad. Yeah. On that as well, in, in supporting students' mental health, when you're going through um, dispute disciplinary procedures um, following cases of academic misconduct. And I think the huge thing with that is just the transparency of processes and ensuring that those processes are accessible to the student. Um, if, you know, our student representatives aren't aware of this and can't see and understand exactly what that process is, then we can't expect the regular student to of institutional policies on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so I think that that is a really important managing pressures where students may already be struggling with their mental health and then facing into a disciplinary procedure, um, but also ensuring that that student has some kind of support, never kind of left in a room alone so that they have a designated person in that room that is there for them or fight their corner and ensure that they're aware of you know the right thing to do so it'd be that big staff member within the institution be it a student representative or whatever you know fits the at an institutional level um things like that can make a really really big difference and um just as I said in terms of the flexibility and accommodations with assessments if we were a little bit of each other um and left a little bit more room for people to have bad days space for people to come forward and say like I really can't do this at the moment and making space I think it would eliminate a, a whole corner of academic dishonesty globally um, and I think my experience I won't say it too broadly I'll say um, I think people pride themselves in the difficulty of academia sometimes um, and you can see that in teachers and as a student you think that maybe that's the way that it should be. It should be that. Um, and it makes it far more difficult to then engage when you need help because, oh, all students', students mental health is meant to be bad. This is meant to be a really difficult time. Um, but you're meant to not, you shouldn't be challenging your mental health, though your own personal well-being. Uh, so I think it's conversations on a day-to-day -day basis and ensuring that the, the policies and procedures are and not just filled with jargon on a big book on a shelf somewhere. Yes, and you both mentioned the, the importance of students' involvement in creating policies and procedures, and I think that is really, really is the key, because this must be done in a dialogue and a conversation. 
we got a comment in a chat from Dita. The mutual trust between the teacher and students is so important. A few days ago, I had an interview with a respectable professor and she mentioned the same thing. So it's great to see that this resonates across generations. That is that it is seen as important on both sides. And also I'm happy that you mentioned that the technology can break into this fragile trust relationship. So, yeah, absolutely. And I, I think as well, with in terms of technology, the experience that everyone had, not to keep going back to it, but I mean, March 2020, upside down. And while students weren't prepared to deal with all of these new technological for most staff. Um, and I think that there was a, a period of kind of try and be able to assess students for their end of year exams then and then this procedure is technology that was implemented at that point in a manner that would never otherwise. And, you know, when we talk about the different types of online proctoring, the successes and the failures, um, you know, we, we talk about, you know, student data and how it should be used and how it, um, and I don't think that anybody was coming from a, a bad place there, but I think most of us of a situation where that went very badly and where maybe a student's privacy um, impinged upon or that they had a very negative experience with it. And I think just I, it was and that it was no fault of anyone. It was unprecedented times, but I think sometimes issues can bleed onwards um, when they're maybe not addressed or, or put to bed or policies and procedures can people can try and prove them that they weren't the wrong thing to do like them as opposed to taking a step back um, so I think that the whole technology question is minefield um, but I think that it is something that is now part of the generation. Um, I don't think it's something that's going to go away um, I also think some of the more knowing that we can take a step back to um, is, is really important and maybe accepting when things don't work well about it. I think that, you know, sometimes we're very concerned about the threat to academic in integrity or by saying that something didn't work as well as we wanted it to. But in fact, I would have much stronger belief in a system that says, OK, this didn't work in the way that we thought try something different um and I think that that's easier said than done very easy for me to say as a responsibility as, as an educator um but that's what I'd love to see as a student I'd love to speak let's let's try something different because this didn't work in the way that we wanted it to um uh, what academia is about it's about teaching and learning and changing as we move forward and I think we perhaps embrace that in the administration and management side of things maybe a little bit more although again been done. yeah and um i would also give an example of uh how the trust can be destroyed by um technology and um, i sound uh quite uh, i don't know conservative <laughs> but uh in the in my home home university um in belarus we had a situation where um, the micro um, headphones were widely used and I haven't heard of them since I moved to Europe and I'm happy about that but basically what I was trying to understand why students are getting involved in this kind of um, behavior um, but I also faced so many uh, cases uh, students telling how they didn't actually use this micro headphones but teachers at the exams were so suspicious um, that they were actually um, like so suspicious that they were not trusting and believing that the student can actually say um, produce this kind of knowledge and um, yeah many students who actually didn't use any kind of um, technology suffered from that a lot uh, and also many students who actually used it um, they had really nice marks and uh, I think it's a very absurd situation I'm, I'm um, hopeful that it's not going to happen uh, anywhere in, in Europe but it can happen and I think to um, yeah to in, in this kind of absurd cases the state plays also a big role 
because um yeah this kind of stuff it's not it's it's to my mind beyond academic integrity and ethics it's it's about um illegal actions mm -hmm. and i think the advertisement and the ways how this kind of um cheating instruments are being promoted need to be um controlled by the state um and also we all we always need to remember that we are in the same community and we should in first place trust each other and then um, see what happens yes i think it's it's amazing and, and i i can understand how also false accusations can be really problematic and uh, really drain students from energy or, or, or the fighting further and, and do the, the work right if they are not. So that trust is really essential. Um, you, you touched so many different aspects uh, and as we don't have any more questions, I would like uh, you to give us assignment and I understand that one assignment assignment you give to us researchers is to, to, to focus more on the relationship between mental health and uh, and uh, uh, misconduct, which we already talked. What other assignments do you think we should do? How can we help you as community of researchers and teachers? Give us homework. It's your turn now. I, I think that the feedback loop is a huge one. Um, definitely look at it a little bit more I mean again with like in terms of research you try and you try again um, with students submitting assignments they're typically seeking feedback from a professor in terms of where they got and why um, but a lot of the time those um, processes can be one um, and I think if we could have a little bit more of a, a circular motion um, in terms of back and forth and ability for students to engage and say a session that could be on once a week or be about mm -hmm. assessment practices and how you can do better and have the space be you know to discuss academic integrity issues and give examples of misconduct and ensure that students you're on their side um have those more casual conversations outside of just talking um humanize the whole process so i think yeah it's kind of just making that space for a back and forth okay no wait I still don't understand um but I think that that would be okay so more feedback more space for for questions um and, and basically more space for academic integrity discussions apparently yeah exactly I would also add just to have more um just to get the feeling of uh what what is the mood um, inside the um, teachers community, for example, how how is it going with academic integrity there, and what like what kind of recommendations um, the special researchers have been given so for so many years are being implemented by teachers or by administrations, and why is not is that not happening? If it's not happening, and how could everyone help that? Um, help with that because talk I think the talks about the higher order learning and the open book exams and the exams in a way that you cannot actually cheat have been be, have been around for so many years but I think it's still a big big um, gap between the implementation and the recommendations and I think it's also to understand how big is that gap um, I'm not sure if there is all of you required research on that, but I think this would also help to um, improve the situation. So that sounds like a good suggestion as well. Organize teacher training so we can uh, teach teachers how to teach academic integrity because apparently there is some there are some gaps between research and practices. And when you said that, I thought directly about using the percentage. Uh, that comes from text matching software, some guideline, which is, of course, totally, totally wrong, as researchers have been uh, talking about and discussing for years, and uh, some people still use it as some sort of indicator, uh, which it definitely is not. 
Uh, okay, and I hope that these webinars are also a part of this uh, discussion, and they are going to be published on the ENI website. I would like to thank Megan and Oras for today. And before we leave, I would like to invite Rita to tell us more about what's coming next, because she is going to be uh, a host for the next webinar. Rita? Thank you for your invitation, Sonia. I'm just sharing with the with everyone the, the next topic of our webinar. In our next webinar, we are going to present about the Victim Support Portal, which I kindly invite you all to have a look. Uh, this portal was recently launched as part of the FATE project, an Erasmus Plus project, and the overall aim is to uh, support anyone who is experiencing an issue of academic or research malpractice. So if you know anyone who is currently struggling, uh, advertise our portal. But in the webinar, we are going to talk uh, more in, in detail about the portal. And also, we will have um, the testimony of someone who, has, who, is a, who was a victim of academic misconduct. We will share her experience, the process that she took, the actions taken, how she felt in terms of the support. And this is something that we are going to focus deeply, is about the importance of raising awareness on the, the need for support victims of academic misconduct. Uh, so we will hear from, from, from her experience and the outcomes of the case. So I invite you all, it will be a very dynamic uh, webinar uh, in an interview way. Uh, so I think it will be very important for everyone. And once again, Megan and Oras, thank you so much for a wonderful uh, webinar and sharing of your experience. We learned so much from you, definitely. We need your voice. And I would also like uh, perhaps to, to, if you're a student listening to this, uh, or else perhaps you want to say a couple of words about student working group that we have at ENI. Yes. And how um, to join. <laughs> yes, um, we have student working group at ENI and um, I think most of the people are there uh, doing PhD research. So I would be really happy if some bachelor students um, would also join us uh, and and bring their um, experience, and um, yeah, it's a it's a learning space where we can uh, discuss things um, we are doing and we want to do, and the problems we are seeing at the moment, and um, together work on on their solution. Um, I can I, I'm not sure if the participants will receive afterwards um, any information, and I think it's important just to give them um, my um, email address um, so they can just text me if they want to join um, the working group and we would be more than happy to have uh, more students so thank you so much once again uh, it was very interesting and it's always a pleasure to, to listening to such uh, an engaging uh, group of students group of two students at least, yeah. Uh, we are definitely, if you're a student, join uh, the group. We would like to see more students uh, because as far as and Mangan said, this must be done in, the, in a dialogue. We can't uh, achieve a culture of academic integrity without uh, having a dialogue with students. So we learned so much from you and thank you for the assignments we got as researchers and teachers and yeah. Uh, see you next time with Rita in the month. Thank you so much.